I talk with patients and their parents about COVID every day, <laughs> every single day, because people come in with all kinds of questions and concerns. And I think part of it is having access to so much information on the internet uh, where you can pretty much find anything to be able to, to, to tell you anything has a lot of people very worried because they are experiencing quite a bit of misinformation um, that they see on the internet about the vaccine and its safety and effectiveness for the younger children. Um, one thing that I'm very hopeful for right now, we're able to vaccinate kids that are five and up. I'm hopeful <laughs> that those numbers will actually uh, continue to decrease in terms of the, the ages of patients that we're able to vaccinate. I'm not sure when we will have uh, vaccinations available for children in the younger age groups. But that, I think, is part of the reason that it's very important to vaccinate the 5 to 11 so that they're not going to school and then bringing the infection home uh, to their younger siblings who are unable to be vaccinated. The biggest, I think, I think I spend quite a bit of time just offsetting various myths about the vaccine, because there certainly are quite a few myths out there. And I would say one of the number one myths uh, that I discuss with families is uh, when they come in and say, isn't it better for my child to just naturally get COVID rather than getting the vaccine? Uh, and the answer to that is no. And there's some significant complications that can come from getting uh, natural COVID. And not the least of which is the MISC, which has now been found in over 8,000 kids in the US, but also that increased risk of diabetes. Uh, but it does seem to be that there's about a two and a half times risk of, of children developing type one diabetes following, um, following natural COVID uh, acquisition. The other concern I've, is I've actually now started to see some families who have had COVID more than one time. Um, and so the question is what long-term effects might be associated with having different strains of COVID over time. And that's something that we're not, we need to, we need to continue to follow and continue to evaluate. But I do think that that is something that is concerning. Getting back to routine, getting back to normal activities, I think is everybody's big priority. Um, and especially for school-aged children and adolescents, being able to be back in school with their friends has been the number one. Every time I have patients come in and we're talking about how they're, they're doing as part of their well child check, I ask them if they prefer remote school or in-person school. And hands down, uh, with very, very few exceptions, I think all of the children have said that they definitely prefer in-person school. They like to be able to see their friends. They want to be able to get back to their usual activities. They don't want to be sitting at home on the computer during the day. Uh, to be able to learn. And in fact, many recognize that they don't learn nearly as well that way. And that uh, appears to be the case for so many teenagers. So helping folks be able to get back to usual school routines, even though we are continuing to test in school, uh, the numbers are the numbers of positive infections right now are still surging uh, just because we don't have all of our school attending children being vaccinated. Another myth that comes up not infrequently is that parents are concerned about the possibility of any future fertility issues for their children. I've also heard some complaints of, of changes in menstrual cycles uh, and concerns about uh, possibly alternating or altering the DNA of patients just by them getting the vaccine. And there's no evidence for any of this to be the case uh, with, again, the multiple billions of vaccine. If you think about across the world, how many people have actually been vaccinated, there does not seem to be amongst either adults or adolescents, any fertility concerns uh, or, or worries about that. The changes in menstrual pattern appear to be mostly anecdotal. That means that they're just reported stories uh, that people notice that they've had changes in their menstrual patterns, but there's not, no study that has been done that has demonstrated that that is a long-term effect or a long-term concern. Uh, I just want to continue to emphasize the 
decrease risk of hospitalization as a result of getting the vaccine. The fact that it is 94% decreased in both the 5 to 11 age group as well as the 12 to 17 year old age group, and certainly a hundred percent decrease in death secondary to natural COVID, I think is a very, very big incentive for having children be vaccinated, uh, both with the primary series of two, as well as getting boosted if they are able when the time comes that five months out. I mean, other myths that people come in with are, you know, if children aren't that severely harmed by COVID, if they're not really getting all that sick from getting natural COVID, why bother? Um, and a, to, as we keep emphasizing, to prevent these long-term outcomes, but also to protect others who may not be able to be vaccinated or who may not get enough, uh, as much immunity secondary to immunosuppression issues, protecting younger age siblings at home, protecting older grandparents um, who, are, who also may be living in the home or helping to care for the children, as well as protecting teachers and staff at school and other people who potentially could be impacted by a COVID outbreak. That and with everyone getting vaccinated, this is how we get out of the COVID outbreaks. Um, and people come in concerned that the vaccine actually might be more of a risk factor at creating different variants. And the opposite is true. Uh, being vaccinated does not create other, vac uh, other variants. It does not predispose people to having other types of variants. And in fact, the variants are created because the virus is being spread amongst people who are not vaccinated and it continues to mutate and spread more efficiently, which is what we're seeing right now with the Omicron compared to previous variants. Uh, that it's much more transmissible, much more easily spread. We're seeing much more positivity, uh, not as significant of disease, at least amongst children and younger people, uh, but still, it's a it's a concern that we we don't want to stay in this pandemic forever, <laughs> um, and we keep pushing back when we think that it may uh, it may be over. And uh, for the foreseeable future right now, as long as we are under vaccinated, we're not vaccinating these key age groups, uh, it's going to be very hard to move forward from, from Omicron and from COVID in general. Yes, there's, again, you can find anything <laughs> on the internet that could potentially be a, a cure or a preventative for COVID. But really the only things that we have, the only real tools in our toolbox that work are masking and social distancing and vaccination. And uh, I, I think that we, we really need to emphasize that some of these more natural remedies or unproven uh, remedies of taking other various medications are not, are not uh, helpful and have not been shown in any studies to decrease the spread of COVID. Um, I think that there is a history amongst uh, culturally about people being skeptical of of medications and and of medicine and of trials and the like because people have certain cultural groups of course have a history of having been treated uh, ex experimentally against their will or without their knowledge and I understand that folks are reluctant to embrace something that is considered to be new. Uh, but the technology for the vaccines has actually been around for many, many years and has not been used up until now with the mRNA type vaccines uh, in any kind of mass scale to prevent against COVID. So it's not that the technology itself is new, it's just that this virus is new and we are now able to utilize uh, protection for ourselves against it. And uh, I think that if anybody is concerned, if they're concerned uh, talking in forums like this or speaking directly to your primary care uh, physician or your child's pediatrician or family medicine doc I, is, is key. Um, 
we won't steer you wrong. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in the science. And I say to families all the time who come in very skeptical, you know, I've been your pediatrician for a long time. In many cases, I was actually the pediatrician for the parent because uh, I've been at CHA for that amount of time. So now some of my earlier patients are now starting to have families of their own. And so I think that that direct connection to me of having known me and having successfully cared for them for so long goes a really long way into helping people feel more comfortable about about getting the vaccine for their children.